Okay, all right. So let's start. So we will go over the last lecture, the previous lecture, uh, one more time. Uh, I don't think I have to go over the one before that, right? I think the one before that was fairly, fairly straightforward review of MOS, um, uh, you know, fundamentals basically. Okay. So uh, last uh, previous lecture, what we did was uh, we did, um, uh, you know, three forms of transconductance. So, um, the saturation equation, you know, we started with that one. So, the three forms of GM, uh, one of them is mu n C ox W by L VGS minus VT, uh, the second one is 2i by VGS minus VT and the third one is square root of this term, right. So, as I said, there are three terms in this equation, one of them is ID, the other one is this K term, you can see when I uh, move things around here, right, okay, good. And then the, the, the third one is VGS minus VT. So, we are just, you know, replacing one versus another and creating these three forms and they are applicable, they are useful in, uh, um, in different, different uh, cases, right. So, these three I want you to commit to your memory, uh, they will be very useful, okay. Uh, so, the, the other insight I provided you was uh, for bipolar transistor, um, for your information the equation is uh, for the current is this. So, then um, if you calculate the GM for bipolar transistor, it is IC divided by VT this VT has nothing to do with VTH of the MOSFETs. This VT is KT over Q, which is 26 millivolts at room temperature, okay. So, when you compare the two cases, one of them is the MOS case, hello, yeah, the MOS case versus the bipolar case. In the, in the MOS case, we typically leave VGS minus VT about 200 millivolts. So, then uh, you get um, ID over 100 millivolts. And then um, for a bipolar case, it's uh, you know 4x higher because it's 25 millivolts. Okay, so this was the point I made, um, and I hope that was clear. And then backgate transconductance, that was the second phenomenon that we talked about. So GMBS is given by um, you know we have this VTH equation. So you do um, uh, del I by del VBS is given by uh, del, del ID by del VTH multiplied by del VTH divided by del uh, VBS and then you will see that uh, this number comes out to be this eta times GM, the eta being approximately up to 0.25, okay. So, uh, the point is the backgate transconductance is about a quarter of the regular GM. Then we talked about output conductance of the transistor. So, the output conductance is uh, when this transistor is in saturation, what is the impedance looking into the drain of that device? Uh, GDS, okay. So, that is given by uh, uh, del ID divided by del VDS, okay. So, we are looking at it like a resistor um, and then if you go through the equation, you will see that it is actually lambda ID. The conductance is equal to lambda ID. Uh, since lambda VDS is uh, much, much smaller than 1, that is what happens. And then the RDS is given by reciprocal of that. So, it is a small signal parameter again here. Now, so with all this, we build this uh, DC small signal model. So, you have GM and you have GMBS and you have GDS and these are the different ports, right. So, that is what we did last time. Uh, then we did uh, a small signal low, low frequency voltage gain for common source amplifier. So, we started with this example. So, if you have something like this, then what does that really mean? Um, you know, so this means that uh, even though we show such a simple circuit, you have supply voltage, you have bias input voltage and then there is a AC source and there is a DC uh, current source, all that stuff that you have to account for. And then what you do is you split it into DC circuit and AC circuit, right. So, the DC circuit is pretty obvious, right, you have V bias and IDC and V supply and then AC circuit, uh, basically we remove, we open circuit all the all the current sources and we short circuit all the voltage sources, that is what we do and you have learned that before, right, many times. So, once you do that, uh, this is a simple AC circuit and that is what the model looks like and then you can calculate the gain, the V out is equal to minus G in V in divided by 1 over GDS, the gain is given by minus, okay, the minus term is important. So, there is an inversion when you uh, take a MOSFET from input to output, GM over GDS. So, this is called the open circuit gain or self gain. Now, uh, once you have this, you can substitute um, from what we know and you will get, uh, you know, two different type of expressions. One of them, it shows that the gain is proportional to square root of ID, uh, 1 over square root of ID, okay. And the other one shows it is uh, 2 divided by lambda VGS minus VT. So, what this tells you is that if you have large channel length, then you will have, uh, you will have a small lambda 
and then you will get high gain okay. and small V G S minus V T also will give you high gain. So, if you have small V G S minus V T what does that mean that means your W by L is pretty high that is what it means okay. Then we went into high frequency uh, small signal model. So, these are all the variety of caps that we learned about in the in the previous lecture. So, I just placed them in there pretty much from every node to any every node there is a cap except for torch to drain there is no uh, no cap right because they are kind of far away from each other physically. So, with that uh, we did a speed of CMOS now this is just a, um, a concept ok um, to tell you uh, you know hey what does this really mean right how fast that MOSFET can go. So, a good way to do that in digital technology is you put two inverters right one following another one and you see how far they can work. So, in this case um, what we are doing is pretty much um, we are connecting the, the another stage next to it and then we are trying to figure out what is the uh, when do you when the gain is equal to unity gain. So, going through this model um, small signal model we figured out that hey you know uh, this is what you get uh, by solving Kirchhoff's current law voltage law and this is the I mean I am not assuming that you know anything more than Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law. So, if you know that then you can pretty much um, you know comfortably uh, figure all these things out. So, this what this tells you is that there is a right half plane 0 and then there is a left half plane 4. So, so then in that case um, you will um, you can you can draw them on the pole 0 plot and you will see that uh, the pole is at lot lower frequency than the 0 ok. And the reason for that is typically GDS is very small ok and C out is very large right because you have a load capacitor which has CGS and the 0 frequency has GM which is high very very large and then CGD is very small. So, you get like double the whammy here right I mean uh, the omega pale is uh, P is lot lot smaller than omega Z. So, then what we do is pretty much we ignore omega Z for the sake of discussion. So, I think someone had asked this question earlier if you remember hey you know why are you ignoring this current through the CGD when we were computing the output uh, output current pretty much the same reason. So, if you had accounted for uh, we will get to that just in a minute uh, then you would get an expression something like this and you would get a 0 uh, if you included that effect ok. And that 0 typically is pretty far out. So, for sake of understanding um, I mean we are trying to do quick hand calculations. So, that is the reason we are ignoring that ok. So, that was the answer to the question uh, or doubt last time. Uh, one more thing uh, that I want to clarify uh, probably some people may not have uh, latched on to this yet is when you show a one pole response like this right. So, then you have a DC gain over here ok and then uh, it goes down uh, 20 dB per decade all right uh, ok uh, 20 dB per decade it goes down. Now, so uh, what does 20 dB per decade mean? What does 20 dB mean? it is a factor of 10 right. So, for every factor of 10 in frequency the gain drops by factor of 10 does that make sense. So, that means, uh, if the frequency increases by factor of 10 the gain drops by factor of 10. So, the multiplication of gain and frequency is constant on that particular line does that make sense ok just by definition. So, then what we can say is that at this particular point the gain is G m over G d s ok and the pole frequency is is given by uh, G, uh, GDS over CGS right. So, if you multiply these two what are you going to get the multiplication of gain and uh, pole frequency is going to be GM over uh, CGS ok. So, now if you travel on this line all the way to this omega t point what is happening at omega t the gain equal to 1 right. So, omega t is equal to then G m over C g s and that is the way we get omega t equal to G m over C g s. So, this part may not have been I did not explain it uh, so elaborately ok. So, is that part clear now why is it G m over C g s hmm? ok. So, pretty much we we calculated the the gain here and we calculated the omega p and from that we can figure out what the omega t is because this is a um, you know 20 dB per decade line. And also the assumption is that the 0 is far out you know it is on this side and it does not uh, it does not make a difference ok. Ok. So, now uh, we went through an example. So, where we put in some numbers and then we figured out the transition frequency something like 167 gigahertz pretty high for this particular technology right. 
in reality you will have to take into account all the second order effects there will be some more capacitors and this will drop down to maybe 100 gigahertz but that's still high then we went through some fundamentals of body plots okay and there we saw that what does zero do right off plane zero it basically lifts up the uh, lifts up the gain because of the zero and then uh, however it will drop the phase further right because it's a right off plane zero so the way to remember that is left off plane pole we know what it does right what does left off plane pole do it will drop the gain um, uh, you know 20 db per decade and then it will drop the phase by 90 degrees so on the left uh, on top of the left off plane pole if i put a left off plane zero then they will get cancelled out right so the left off plane zero will do exactly opposite to left off plane pole so left off plane zero is a helper in terms of frequency response okay it removes the pole so uh, so then the gain drops and the frequency uh, phase lifts up with the left off plane zero and right off plane zero will do just the same thing with the gain however the phase will be opposite direction okay so that's kind of the way you should remember so we went through this analysis and pretty much figured out that the the frequency response will look like this right you will have a gm over gds gain and we know how to calculate omega t and the zero will be far out there somewhere uh, next we went through some numbers so these are the numbers i kind of am going to use for this all the illustrations okay so where uh, vt for nmos will be this gamma will be this tox will be this and you know mobility is this and then from these numbers we calculated uh, different things to be used for all our calculations so it would be good if you went through this on your own and um, and put these numbers and you know feel comfortable about it okay so cox is uh, 3.9 femtofarad per micron square and it's a convenient unit uh, so for 1 micron square you get 3.9 femtofarads okay you have to get comfort you have to get comfortable with femtos picos and nanos so that when uh, when it comes to evaluations your projects you know you don't want to really make mistakes in these trivial things right so just get a handle on all these things uh, lambda n we figured out how to calculate that because the way it's specified is you have a number and then that is specified for the minimum channel length in that technology so then from that you can figure out for any other um, length okay so mu n cox for uh, for this technology is uh, 136.5 uh, microamps per volt square and then for pmos is 39 microamp per volt square okay so then after that we went through an example so the purpose of this example was to show you the magnitude of gm and gds okay so we calculated gm value that comes out to be 738 micro siemens and gds value is something like 0.1 micro siemens okay so you can see there is a large difference between gm and gds and when you have gm plus gds you can ignore gds that's the reason for that then we went through a high frequency figure of merit this is another way to calculate ft and typically uh, what you do is um, you you look at the current gain of the transistor okay so uh, in in all technologies this is the way it's defined um, and then uh, the current gain you can calculate and you will pretty much come back to the same result uh, which we did before which is right here 3 by 4 uh, mu n divided by vgs minus vt in l square so the key point again we were trying to say was the l square right the uh, the ft is proportional to uh, 1 over l square so the larger the channel length right what happens ft gets worse all right and the other thing was ft improves with current density that's uh, that's what we uh, we figured out so given w you can if you pump in more current your ft will improve next thing we did was uh, small signal uh, terminal impedances this is like a cheat sheet right so you go through all possible uh, cases and you know keep this in your head all the time so that you can uh, quickly make judgment calls about uh, various modes of operations of the transistor okay so in this particular case uh, the impedance looking here will be GDS and then the cap will be CGD plus CG, uh, CDD. Uh, for this particular case looking into the gate you will see CGS plus CGD and G is almost 0. Okay? And if you look into the source you will, you will get body effect plus GDS, okay? both of them. And so this is pretty much like a low impedance node. Hmm? Um, and then 
most important thing to remember in this particular uh, case and where people make mistakes is remember that this node is grounded okay the drain is connected to ground if the drain is not connected to ground this result is not valid okay so many times you will get tricked into um, into a question where uh, hey uh, you get you assume that when you look into the source of a device it's always one over gm right you will think that but it's not because if you have open circuit here if you have current source then this equation is not true all right so we will get to that as we move forward uh, so looking into the source you have cgs plus csb okay so these are pretty much straightforward um, and then uh, uh, again you know here we we did a different example where you don't have body effect but when you don't have body effect you are actually connecting the well uh, to this source. So, when you actually design this, uh, this circuit right you will have a well and that well will be connected to the source. Now, well is pretty big generally the devices are pretty tiny, but you could have multiple devices in the same well and well has lot more square footage right. So, then you have lot more capacitance that will hang off that node hang off that source. So, you have to take into account all that stuff. Now, if you do not intentionally put something in your simulations you may miss this out and then you will find out when you go to the last stage of your simulation when you do extractions from the layout and uh, there you will always find this and you may find hey my schematic simulation looks really good, but my layout simulation looks lot worse. So, this is one of the first mistakes that people do um, and they miss out this well capacitance. The other thing we did was just a simple diode connected uh, device and there uh, you will get GM plus GDS looking in and whenever there is a diode connected device we say ok it is a GM you know is the impedance because GDS is very small and then also you will see CGS plus CDB and you will say oh it is a CGS that is what you will get. So, these are the trade offs you should be able to do it in your head um, you know you will get an accurate answer, but then you should be able to filter out um, you know all the things which uh, which are small and then latch on to the big big numbers ok. So, that is pretty much what we did last week. So, today we are going to start with amplifiers common source amplifier ok. Now, what does the word common source mean? So, you have a MOSFET it looks like that and we know this is the source right. So, you have input and you have output between input and output source is common and that is why it is called common source amplifier ok. Many times people do not know this they just know it is common source amplifier and then uh, it is important to know these details right. And this is your V out R D and V A and it is called this is M 1. So, now large signal wise what is really going on here ok let us try to figure out. So, let us draw on the x axis you have V in this is D C by the way ok and on the y axis we have V out ok. So, um, we already know if um, if your input is below V T and what happens what should be the output. Huh? V ready right. So, and the transistor M 1 is in cut off region right ok. And then um, as um, as input goes uh, beyond V T and the transistor will start conducting ok. So, then it will uh, start doing something like this right. Uh, now, what is the transistor uh, which mode is it in saturation because V D S is very large you start off from VDD and then it will start dropping until you reach this uh, this particular point where V out is uh, goes below VD sat. Actually this is not right something like that ok and then eventually um, um, 
actually it will not go to 0 because it will depend on some number here ok. So, what is going on here it is um, let us mark down here m 1 is in saturation region and here m 1 is in non sat or triode region ok and this V 1 is equal to this V T n ok that is the equation for uh, uh, when the transistor gets out of uh, saturation ok. So, now let us uh, we are interested in this region because we want to operate the transistor in saturation region and that is where you have this gain that is happening and we are trying to figure out what the gain of the transistor is right. Another feedback I got is you want me to slow down when I do this. So, you can see what is going on right ok. So, I will ta take your feedback I appreciate the feedback ok. So, let us do um, small signal. model in sat region ok and here we are going to ignore first R out so you have V in and that is your gate and that is your source. this is gate source and this is your drain. I ignored R out is this part clear everybody huh? ok. So, then now we can say that uh, V out A C is equal to minus G M R D times V A and our voltage gain is A V So, we know that G m is uh, the three forms of G m mu n C ox uh, W by L and then uh, V G s uh, minus V T H of n mos or 2 I d divided by V G s minus V T n and is equal to square root of 2 mu n I d ok. So, the key observation here is that um, uh, if your input signal swing right is really large ok. So, this term is going to change quite a lot V g s right because you are um, so the all these equations are valid when uh, um, when you you have certain DC bias and then on top of that there is a small signal excursion, but if you apply a large signal then these quantities are also changing the I d will change if you are applying a really large signal. So, keep that in mind ok and if because of that what happens is that as the gain changes with input signal um, or the I d will change uh, uh, with the input signal and then what will end up happening is um, um, gain of the circuit changes a lot for large signal because of I d and V g s minus V t changing. So, um, because of that so there is something called distortion that we are going to deal with later on that will happen ok. Do you know what distortion is? Yes, uh, but if you put in a sine wave and you distort it you will start getting harmonics uh, and that is that is another way to look at it ok. Because you start clipping right if you scream if I scream into this microphone you it will be unbearable after a while I mean uh, because of the microphone not because of me 
but uh, so then that's the distortion. It's, it's overloading, right? So that's um, that's something that you have to watch out for. Okay. So now let's uh, since we did the simple analysis, let's do little more complex. I mean, we are going to build step by step how to do this thing. So including the channel length modulation now. Or R out effect. So you have V in and you have GM times V in and you have R out and then you have RD. So what is the gain now? So A V is equal to V out divided by V in is equal to minus G m times R out parallel with R d okay? because these two resistors are in parallel and we know the formula for this is R out plus R d. So now it depends on who is dominating is R out dominating or R d dominating in this expression. right? So um, a good way to uh, figure this out right, is um, Whenever you have to calculate the gain, you have to do, um, you know, GM of the driver okay. and on bottom you look at G out looking up plus G out looking down. Okay. When you look at the output node, you want to add these two G outs. So now um, you will say, hey, sometimes you are using this G's and sometimes you, you are using the R's, right? I think I already gave you the answer for that. So uh, whenever you are adding things in parallel, uh, you use the G's because you just have to, uh, uh, you can add the G's, the conductances. So, so that way it becomes easier to do the calculations, okay? So this pretty much is the effective output conductance. Okay. And in this case would be uh, equal to G M 1 divided by uh, G out of the transistor or G D S plus uh, 1 over R D okay. is the um, G of the resistor, okay. conductance of the resistor and again negative sign not to be forgotten. Now let us do a common source amplifier. So here we are going to use a PMOS transistor and on the bottom we have an NMOS transistor. So this is your V in, V out, M2, VDD. Okay. So by inspection we can say that uh, what is uh, uh, what is AV, what did I say? minus um, G m of the driver uh, divided by uh, G out going up plus G out going down okay. by inspection. Now that I mean we went through all these uh, individual transistor cases in the last lecture and I reviewed it today again. So looking up what do you see? Uh, first of all this is G m 1 is that part clear? That is the transistor this is the driver transistor right and then what is looking up? Looking up here, what do you see? Huh? Conductance. What is the conductance looking up? GM2. GM2. Good. Somebody said plus, right? So that's good. I'm really sorry about this. I seems to have misplaced my pen, and this is my backup pen. It doesn't write write very well. Okay. 
gm2 what is plus looking up gds2 okay is that part clear because this will have uh, this will have a gm um, uh, component to it a gm2 plus it will have the gds of this device okay and looking down what would you get looking down it's going to be gds1 okay so what do what's the next step that we do you guys are bunch smart guys now right what do you do next step to simplify what would you ignore you would ignore these two right i already showed you that these numbers are typically small okay so then this becomes minus gm1 divided by gm2 okay so then we will um, add numbers here basically that's going to be equal to minus what is the gm1 is uh, 2 mu n c ox uh, w W by L of N mos ID divided by square root of 2 mu P C ox W by L of P ID. Is that clear? Okay. So most of the stuff cancels, and then what you get is mu N divided by mu P and uh, W by L of n mos divided by w by l of p mos and square root of that and negative sign okay so what's the first insight when you do something like that hmm? the gain is pretty small okay it's basically these gms are kind of comparable right it's not like gm over gds so in this case you your gain is pretty small but it can be uh, you know decided by just the ratios of the uh, ratios of the two transistors okay and ratios of the mu n's okay square root of that um, so the low voltage gain you are going to get something like 2 to 6 you know you can control uh, this gain other issue with this one is you have low output swing What is VO minimum for this one? Can anybody tell? What is the minimum voltage that you can have at the output to keep this guy in saturation? Everything in saturation. VD sat of this device, right? VD sat one. Okay. Number one. Which can be something like uh, you know 200 to 250 millivolts. Okay, and what is VO maximum that you're gonna have? Hmm? VDD minus VGS of this device, right? And what does that contain? VGS of that device. I mean, technically speaking, we should say VSG. But I think you understand the spirit of what I am saying, right? I mean, if you are writing it down, you would say VSG or you would say you will put a mod and all that stuff. But you just have to think of uh, NMOS and PMOS, you know, the signs correctly. Hmm? So, um, I mean, I do the inversion in my head basically. Okay, so, uh, so VDD minus VSG of PMOS, okay, and that is equal to VDD minus. Uh, you have VT of PMOS plus VD sat of PMOS. Okay. So now that is what is VDD? Let us say you have 1.2 uh, volt supply, for example. Okay. Then VT is uh, what we said is uh, something like 0.6 volts. And again, VD sat of PMOS is uh, 0.25 volts, let us say. So then you are not left with much, you are only left with. Uh, 0.35 volts. So you can see that um, you know 250 millivolts to 350 millivolts. There is not much swing that you can get out of this thing. 
Okay, so the next one I am going to show you is the second case which would be uh, I am going to use an NMOS transistor. this is V out and then I would connect this to ground the bulk of that device right. So, in this case what do we by inspection can you tell me what goes on what is the GM AV gain is equal to minus uh, GM driver is GM 1 this is M 1 and M 2 ok. And on the bottom what is G, uh, uh, G out up is uh, GM 2 plus what else? Uh, so, the next one will be GM BS 2 right because you you are not connecting it back to its source. So, you will have a GM BS term and this is something we did previously uh, if you remember review that again if you want and also you will get a GDS 2 ok and plus you will get another GDS 1 ok. So, now if you ignore this uh, compared to this then you will get uh, A v is equal to minus G m 1 divided by G m 2 plus uh, G m B s 2 ok. And that is equal to you can uh, you can say that you can prove it uh, that W by L of top guy divided by W by L of bottom guy square root of that negative and then you will have also term called 1 over 1 plus eta ok. So, you can you can go through this calculation by yourself So, this is approximately 0.25 again here also you will get low gain and low swing That brings me to the next one. Uh, everybody okay with this so far? Hmm? Okay. So now we do CS amplifier again, common source amplifier. With current source load. Okay. So I'll draw the whole circuit first. So, you have a current source load this is your N MOS M 1 and this is your P MOS M 2 and now we want to bias this at V bias ok and this is your V N. So, then how do you bias that at V bias you do another device here a current mirror. and then you put some current through it and this is your I bias and this is the bias transistor ok. So, now let us do the transfer curve for this one this is your V in and this is your V out. So, uh, as you uh, uh, when V in is equal to 0 what happens output is hmm? So, let us say when V in is below V t V t n the output will be V d d right and the transistor will be um, M 1 will be in cut off region ok and then we will start slowly dropping down and at certain point you just start conducting this uh, device right this will be close to VDD. So, the voltage across M 2 will be very very small does that make sense when you are just beginning. So, the transistor M 2 is in which region linear region right because um, when we started off this voltage was 0 
Now this voltage only when it goes beyond VD set of this device M2 will be in saturation region that is clear ok alright. So, then that is going to be a VO max hmm? and then it will uh, it will keep going down let me draw the whole curve and then it will look something like this. So, similarly the, the same thing will happen here on this side V O min and in this region is when you will have M 1 and M 2 both in saturation. So, in this region M 2 is in uh, non sat or linear region and in this case M 1 will be in non sat ok. So, this would be a V D sat of 2 and this would be V D sat of 1. Is this part clear what I am doing? this is something that you should be able to do after practice with few circuits ok and eventually you do not have to even do that you will know ok I mean this is where my transistor is biased um, the VGS and v, VD sat is something that you have to be able to play around with ok. So, you want to keep your transistor in this region. So, now let us talk about the bias circuit right. So, if W by L of the bias transistor is equal to W by L of the this two transistor what does that imply? That means, the same current which is flowing here will be flowing here assuming both transistor is in saturation right the left is on in saturation right. So, I uh, V G S uh, I is equal to K V G S minus V T square and the same thing I am applying to this guy I V G S minus V T square ok. So, then assuming this transistor is in saturation that will be the same current flowing ok. We are ignoring the the, the the channel and modulation effect for now. So, if this is the case then you get I 1 is equal to I 2 is equal to I B ok. Now, let us do V B 2 what will be V B 2? Um, uh, it is again uh, V D D minus V T P plus V D set 2 which is the V G S of this device ok. So, that is the bias voltage yeah this is V B 2 ok and uh, V B 1 is equal to which is the bias voltage for the M 1 for M 1 that is given by V T n plus V D sat 1 ok. So, let us write the equation for V D sat 1 and V D sat 2. V D sat 1 is equal to square root of 2 times I B divided by mu and C ox W by L 1 and V D sat 2 is equal to square root of 2 I B mu P C ox of 2. Okay. So, that is the way you calculate them and now when both are in saturation when M 1 and M 2 saturation we can do the small signal analysis and it is going to look like this uh, let me draw it on a separate sheet this sheet of paper. So, you will see uh, your V in and you will have a G m 1 times V in and then you will have G d s 1 
and you will also have this other one which is GDS2 due to the top transistor. Okay. Both transistors are in saturation, uh, but the driving device is only the M1 and this is, uh, this is a small signal equivalent circuit. So, looking up you are going to see GDS2, looking down you are going to see GDS1 and driver is this guy. So, that is what this uh, thing looks like. So, now what is the voltage gain A V is equal to minus G M 1 divided by G D S 1 plus G D S 2. Let us substitute what is G M 1 2 times I B divided by V G S minus V T of N MOS. N MOS and then on the bottom we have lambda N times I B right. If you remember G D S expression and this would be lambda P times I B. Okay. So, simplifying your gain is going to look like minus 2 divided by V D sat 1 and lambda N plus lambda P. So, what is the insight here? If we want to increase the gain, what do you have to do? VD sat should be as small as possible, and these lambda numbers have to be also small, right? So, then what do you need to do for that lambda? Huh? Hmm? Huh? You have to increase the channel length. So, um, um, to increase gain reduce V D set and increase length. Okay. Now Having said that right V D sat is given by one is given by V G S minus V T one is equal to square root of two I divided by So, for a given current I, if you keep increasing your W by L, what will happen? The V D sat will, will keep reducing, right. Now, can you continue this forever, right? Because what this expression is telling you is that um, if I keep doing this w increasing the W by L, right, my, my V D sat will keep reducing and reducing, this will keep reducing, right, and then I can really get really good amount of gain. Hmm? Is that possible? Hmm? Uh, let us ignore capacitance for a minute, let us assume only DC circuit, even then is it possible. And that was the question I was uh, you know trying to address your, your question. So, let me show you. So, if you plot square root of I D versus V G S. Okay. So, square root of I D is uh, linear uh, with respect to VGS minus VT, right? Correct? Because I am taking square root. So, then it is going to look like uh, straight line. And where would it intersect the VGS axis? Huh? At VT, right? Because below VT there is no current flowing. That is our assumption. So, it is going to look like this. Assume this is linear. Okay? And then uh, this is our VT uh, N, right? Okay, let me do this again better hmm? and this is the V T n. Now, if we keep reduce where is V G S minus V T on this uh, on this thing right. This is V T. So, V G S minus V T is let us say we are putting V G S of this much then V G S minus V T is represented by this does that make sense. 
for every point. And as we start reducing VGS minus VD, let's say if you are, this was your operating point, then this this would be your um, VD sat, okay. And as you start redu increasing this W by L, you are reducing, you are coming towards this. Is it making sense? You are reducing VGS minus VD. So you will come here, you will come here, you will come here, right? And as a result of which, what's going on? You are coming very close to VT, okay? And then, as as you um, Arpit pointed out, right, that uh, it will you will come into this region, which is called what is that region called? We talked about this in lecture one, right? So this is subthreshold region. Okay. So you want to stay away from that region because the gain characteristics change. Um, again, the reason we are doing that this is um, eventually you will run a simulation and get the answer that you need, right? But to be able to quickly tell, um, you know, you want to have some numbers in your head, right? So you want to stay away from this region because now suddenly the equations change, right? And also, um, when you simulate in that that region, you will not be able to since the transistor is going from uh, you know saturation to subthreshold region, you will not be able to predict what's going to happen there. Okay, so. Um, Typically, we want to stay away from that region and then you want to keep your VGS minus VT at least 150 millivolts. In old days, when the technology was, uh, you know, one micron or something, it used to be 300 millivolts, 400 millivolts to stay away from that. Now, we are comfortable keeping 150 millivolts to 200 millivolts margin, okay? So, that is one reason. On top of that, I think uh, Arpit also pointed out that what is going on is you have um, this is VGS, right? So let's say I chose um, chose this particular point and kept VGS minus VT really small, right? On top of that, I have to have a signal swing on that bias voltage, right? Now, as soon as you put this bias voltage, what's going to happen? For this bottom piece, you're going to go in the subthreshold region, right? So depending upon the signal swing, you want to be away from that region, okay? So those are the two factors you have to keep in mind. One is stay away from subthreshold region and allow for input voltage swing, okay? So those two factors, because of which they will govern your VGS minus VT. Hmm? Is this particular? Because this is a really important point I'm trying to make here. If it's not clear, go back and you know kind of review what I'm saying. So uh, to allow for these two things, which is uh, first of all, uh, you know you want to allow for some signal swing, and with the lowest part of the swing, you don't want to be within that region of subthreshold region. So then. Uh, that's what decides your VGS minus VTs, and that's what decides your W by L ratios that you choose for a given current. Okay, so that's the design practice. Now, the previous example we talked about, I think it answers your question now, right? Because you don't want to be in that region where even if it's diode connected, you just want to stay away from that region. So the, um, you know, in today's technology, I've been using uh, VDSAT uh, greater than 150 millivolts or so. You know, and later on, as we go through the course, you'll see where all these VDSAT props up. You know, uh, it will uh, it will make a difference to your performance in RF circuit design. There are certain requirements, mismatches. There are certain requirements, right? So all those things you have to take into account. It's not just one simple thing that decides your VGS minus VT. Okay, but you want to keep it at least above 150 millivolts, and plus on top of that, allow for signal swing. Okay, so now we will do uh, common source amplifier. With active load. What does the word active mean? Huh? So far, uh, we were using these current sources, resistors. Uh, they were not doing anything to the signal path. They were just offering an impedance. Um, high impedance, low impedance, whatever that is. Now, when I say active load, what that means is uh, the load also contributes to gain. Okay, and so the one way to do that would be connect the two together. This is your V in.
m n. Okay, so you get the point. Basically, uh, the the PMOS portion, which we used to be biased, now suddenly that's also offering signal gain. Hmm? Okay, so now in this case, we would draw the the small signal circuit just by inspection. It will look like this. We will have a GMN uh, VN. And you will have GDSN, okay. And then on the top, you will also see GMP, VN, and I will see GDSP, okay. And this will be grounded, the VDD V ground for small signal analysis, and this will be our V out. Is this part clear? How I got here? Okay. So simplifying, all we get is very simple. V in GMN GMP V in. And was this resistance going to be anybody? GDS N plus GDS P. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, the A V gain is given by minus G M N plus G M P divided by GDS N plus GDS P. So, so far you are with me right everyone anybody is missing this. So, we step by step went through a lot of derivative circuits you know we made a twist here we made a change here and whenever some um, I want to take you through variety of uh, configuration. So, that after practicing you know just by looking at it you can tell kya ho hai circuit mein. The goal is by end of this course, if I throw you a big schematic, you should be able to quickly decipher uh, what is going on in this circuit, not be intimidated by it, right. And this is the way you do it. You kind of uh, lock on to patterns, you know, this is what is going on, this is what is going on. And these are the simple, simple examples on which you can build on the higher level circuits. So, it is important to pay attention into all these small, small details because everything that you are going to do afterwards, you are going to build on top of this, okay. So, subtleties of design I am explaining to you right now, you really um, you know internalize all those things. Okay. So, this is the expression. Now, let us uh, take it a step further. Hmm? So, I want to take a numerical example. So, you appreciate uh, So, we want to get gain of uh, A V A V greater than equal to 100 okay. and then uh, V out minimum is equal to 250. Okay, it's doing something funny on me. Let me try this. What do you do when something doesn't work? Huh? That's what I'm going to do. Just remove the battery and you know put it back in. Apology for the delay. It's a Microsoft product. So. Hopefully, it will behave now. Voila, works well now. Okay. So, V out minimum is 250 millivolts and V out maximum 
is equal to also uh, ADD minus 250 millivolts. Um, CL is equal to 1 picofarad and FU is equal to 100 megahertz. This is your unity gain frequency. And the circuit is again the same. So, we have W by L of P, W by L of N. This is the C L and this is the out. This is V L. Okay. So, this is what we are going to design right now. These are the conditions we want gain to be greater than 100. Or equal to 100 and V out minimum. What does V out mean and V out max tell you? Hmm? Correct, yeah, VD sat 1 and VD sat 2, that is what it is telling you. It is telling you that VD sat of each transistor is about uh, has to be less than 250 millivolts, okay, because we want the swing uh, to be beyond that. So, now let us uh, analyze this circuit, we pretty much have done it. So, the small signal analysis looks like this, and you will get a cap also here C L. So, G m effective times V n and this is your V out. Yeah. So, if we uh, write the expression out you will see V out or V n is equal to minus G m effective V n divided by G out effective plus what will you get? I am kind of introducing the concept of frequency response sneakily. Okay. What will you have with G out effective? Huh? S C M very good. So, it is again uh, admittance and uh, conductance right you are adding them together. So, that is why it makes it makes it easier to deal with when this happens. So, then what we do is we say G m effective divided by G out effective divided by 1 plus S divided by G out effective divided by C l. Is this part clear? I think we have done it before right. So, what is this term called? Hmm? D C gain. Because at s equal to 0, this is what you got, right. And what is this called? It is omega p pole frequency, right. I think you are familiar with that now. Okay. So, let us draw the picture for this. So, this is the location for omega p, which is equal to g out effective divided by C L and then we will have a roll off which is 20 dB per decade per decade minus 20 dB per decade and this is A D C which is given by G M effective divided by G out effective. And what is omega t now? Can somebody tell? Just by inspection, G m effective divided by C m. And what happens at omega t? 
or sorry not omega t uh, this is not omega t this is omega u that is what we are talking about right omega u and this is equal to uh, ugf unity gain frequency hmm, where a v is equal to 1. So, f of u is equal to omega u divided by 2 pi I think you all know that right which is equal to 1 over 2 pi times g m effective divided by C L and that is given by 100 megahertz. Now, note that I have ignored all the transistor capacitances. Huh? Which one are we talking about? Huh? Omega u or omega p? Omega p will be g out effective divided by c because it is a smaller number also c l. Okay? And omega u unity gain frequency will be multiplication of these two a d c times omega p correct. And then the g o effective cancels out and then you get g m effective divided by c l alright good question. Okay. So, um, also in this all analysis right I have ignored the transistor capacitances why because the transistor capacitances are pretty small in femtofarads type of numbers whereas, what we are talking about is picofarad of capacitor right now. So, for simplicity. Uh, you know I am kind of removing that clutter uh, and just focusing on what the output capacitance is going to do to you. But in reality as as you peel the onion further and further you will start including all those things in your equations ok. And there will be a point at which you should start simulating ok. But the hand analysis should give you confidence in terms of who is where and after simulations you should be yeah within 25 percent of what you thought and that is fairly good design in that sense. The purpose of doing hand uh, what happens another um, um, insight I would like to give you is um, and, and I am glad that I am telling you this right now. Um, what will happen to you as if you become a circuit designer is um, you can easily get into this path of drive by simulation ok, where you forget about insights. The first thing you draw something up you 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 simulate ok and uh, that is a dangerous territory to be in ok. Sometimes simulator can lie to you because you did not ask the right question ok. So, it is important to do things on paper understand everything and then once you get hang of it what you are doing then you can check with simulator. But it is important to have a confidence in your understanding that simulator is not telling you something right because you are not biased something correctly. Huh? So, uh, do not forget what I am telling you right now because it will bite you back later on. Uh, you will get into that zone where um, there is deadline and you just have to put something together simulate it and you will show up um, as a presentation and somebody will just painful person like me will just ask you really simple question and then everything falls apart and you will lose your face. At that time do not claim that you are my students ok. So, do handwritten analysis make sure you understand and only you after that you do the simulations. And simulations are there to help you uh, get you out of uh, you know place where um, you know sometimes you, you get into a place where uh, you did not account for certain things and simulator will tell you that oh by the way you are getting into this getting into this situation and it is not uh, your circuit is not going to work for this reason. So, simulator should be used as uh, um, you know final verification of your idea, but it is important to do everything on paper um, you know the circuit should be solid when you do it on paper ok. Uh, this is what we started off designing. So, uh, if this is the case then we can get g m effective what is g m effective now is equal to 2 pi C L times 100 megahertz. And C L is um, um, 1 puff is, is that what I said. So, you can substitute 1 picofarad here and this 
will come out to be 628 micro siemens. Okay, now, we want symmetric output voltage thing. So, what that means is V d sat of n MOS is equal to V d sat of P MOS is equal to 250 millivolts. I think that is pretty obvious, right. So, what this tells you is um, square root of 2 i divided by k n w by l of n MOS is equal to square root of 2 i k p p right. So, this expression tells you that w by l of p MOS is equal to k n divided by k p times w by l of n MOS. Okay. Now, this number if you remember the first uh, or second lecture um, we computed that to be 136.5 micro amp per volt square okay. and this number was 39. Microamp per volt square. Okay, this is basically mu and C ox, and those are the values we just discussed in the last lecture. So W by L of P MOS should be equal to 3.5 times W by L of N MOS. That's what will fall out of this expression. Okay. The other thing is uh, GM of N MOS we want to keep it symmetrical, so that you can say that G m of n MOS is equal to G m of P MOS is equal to 2 i divided by V d sat. So, uh, we already equated the two V d sat, so this will automatically happen the same current flows through both the transistors right. So, G m effective what is G m effective we said G m of n MOS plus G m of P MOS is equal to that right. So, um, you can uh, use this expression did we compute the current ok. We, we just said that uh, ok if you remember the GM effective is 628 micro Siemens. So, then we we appropriate half for NMOS and half for PMOS. So, that would be uh, 314 and 314 okay, for NMOS and PMOS. So, we can we can say that uh, GM of NMOS equal to GM of PMOS equal to 314 micro Siemens. Is this part clear hmm? from the previous expression? So, now we can tell that uh, what is the current value I uh, 2 I divided by V d sat is equal to G m right. So, uh, that is equal to G m of let us say n MOS. So, this will give you I is equal to G m of n MOS times V d sat divided by 2 is this part clear. So, current value is you can substitute the value 314 micro Siemens times 250 millivolts divided by 2 will come out to be something like 39.25 microamps. So, that is the current at which we are going to bias it. So, based on specification we are kind of slowly going after each piece at a time and trying to figure out how are we going to make this design work. So, to maximize the voltage gain you uh, you want to keep uh, A v is equal to G m n plus G m p divided by G d s n plus G d s p you know you want to keep all these guys equal 
so that you can maximize the um, you know voltage gain. So, this G D S n is equal to G D S p. I mean there are multiple ways to do this thing, but then you make assumptions and you move on with it. So, here you assume that let us make G M uh, G D S n equal to G D S uh, p and we can move on and come up with a solution. So, what is G D S n anybody is given by lambda times uh, I ok. So, we know lambda is equal to 0 0.05 divided by L n again this is based on the previous uh, expressions that we have done and L n is not given in meters, but actually is in micro micrometer ok. So, that is the important point and this multiplied by I and similarly uh, G D S uh, P is equal to lambda P times I which is equal to 0.1 divided by L P this is in microns times I. So, what does this tell you if you if you compare these two we want them to be equal. So, uh, G D S n equal to G D S P that will give you L of P should be equal to 2 times L of n if you just equate these two. So, channel lengths. Okay. So, now going back to our A V expression what we are saying is uh, I want 628 micro Siemens that was my total G M effective divided by 2 times G D S right because G D S n and G D S p that is equal to 100 that is what I wanted. So, that will tell you that G D S of n or p should be equal to 3.14 micro Siemens. Does that make sense? Because it's hundred, it's going to be by that factor. So now we can go back to how do we get that? So what we can say is 0 0.05 times I divided by ln is equal to 3.14 micro Siemens, and that will give you ln is equal to point 0 0.05 times 39.25 microamps the current that we figured out divided by 3.14 micro Siemens. So, this will give you L n is equal to 0.625 micro sorry ok. Now, here is another insight that you need to remember. Okay. So, this number the process technology what process technology we were using 0.5 right 0.5 micron technology. So, typically um, when you are doing this design in a CAD tool right uh, the grid or the minimum uh, unit is set uh, at 0.25 half of that channel length. Okay. So, you can only go in steps of 0.5 you know and plus 0.25 onwards. So, if L n is coming out like this then what is the next best L n you can use hmm? 0 0.75 micron ok. So, I mean we figured hello yeah we figured out a number now we that is the lowest limit right. So, we since our gain has to be greater than 100. So, um, you know you want to increase the channel then beyond that value. Hmm? So, this is the minimum. So, if L n is this then what is L p? We just went through that expression right 2 times it will be 1.5 microns ok. Now, another point um, maybe today it would not make sense, but as you, but I want to sow the seed right now because. Um, when you get into the layout stage right when you start laying out this transistor and I saw some designer do this couple of days ago. Um, this key point is um, um, you know what do you set your grid snap to grid ok when you are doing the layout and some of the people who have already doing layout then they probably know what I am talking about, but um, it is like when you are drawing something in Microsoft uh, office right and you you put a grid and suddenly in between you started changing grids right 
and then when you try to put things together things get messed up things don't line up and no matter what you do uh, things don't get, get line up so similar thing happens in uh, in the layout environment okay you set the grid setting at the beginning of the project and you never touch it okay because what will happen is that if you change the grid setting somewhere in between of the project and let's say you come to the tape out of the project right nothing will work because the, the database will be totally unclean and you have to redo the layout part again and that's a lot of effort. So the lesson for you is remember this never change the touch the grid setting basically the snap to grid part keep it the default value um, otherwise uh, all the stuff that you're doing like DRCs they will not work later on okay and you may not know that in the early stages of the project you will find out when it comes to the chip level and all things are being put together and I will have three weeks to tape out and then you have to redo everything again and it becomes really really painful and there's a high chance of you getting fired at that point okay so don't do that I mean that's why I'm telling you all these nuggets of information so that you you remember these things okay so um, 0 0.425, 0 0.5 micron technology, the grid is at 0.25 micron and that's why we are doing this, okay. And then we round up and then that's what you get, okay. So uh, coming back, um, oh, shoot, okay. Just uh, let me finish this train of thought and you can go after that. I went over. So VDSAT uh, NMOS is equal to? square root of 2i divided by uh, uh, kn w by f n mos that should be less than 0.25 uh, volts right now we are trying we figured out everything else except w's is that part clear we figured out l we figured out i um, so now we need to figure out w so then he, with this expression you can see that w by l of n mos hmm, has to be greater than 2i uh, divided by kn 0 0.25 square which is equal to 2 times uh, 39.25 microns of current uh, 136.5 micro amp per volt square and then times 0.25 volt square. So this comes out to be 9.2 if you calculate. So W of N should be greater than 9.2 uh, times uh, 0.75 microns. Okay, this is W by uh, this is this one. So then you multiply by length, uh, channel length. So then this will become 6.9 microns. So then what do you do? Round it up, and this becomes 7 microns. Okay. And then you can get W, w of uh, P MOS is equal to 3.5 times uh, 7 divided by 0 0.75, which is equal, uh, and sorry, 1.5 is equal to 49 micron. I kind of went in a rush over here, but this is something that no matter how I explain you really have to do it yourself okay so go sit sit down with a cup of coffee you know write down on a piece of paper coffee or any other liquids um, and then you know go through all the calculations by yourself and you will feel good after that and you can have more liquids after that okay so the final thing that comes out uh, is very simple we designed a circuit that meets a spec that looks simply like this okay uh, this is your VDD and uh, this is 49 microns divided by 1.5 microns and this would be 7 microns divided by 0.75 microns and this is the capacitance which is 1 picofarad. So, bahut sare papad bell ne pade iske figure out karne liye. Ye do transistor ke size ki figure out. But once you do it a few times, right, you will start making these approximations in your head and then things will be easy to you. So this is where you should not go to simulations, right? Because in simulation land you can just tweak things and then you can get an answer. So the homework which is given to you 
is kind of going over the same concepts agreed you do some hand calculations and then you try it out in simulations do not do it in simulations first and then do the hand calculations to match the simulations ok do the hand analysis first it is ok if you get a wrong answer right between do not match but do the and try to figure out why some things are different right so that would be a good way to understand ok thank you very much. Mm -hmm.